Excuse me. So I'm going to start off by showing a brief video that is about a public art project that we did where we brought in a French artist, JR, who had taken mate, pictures of people at different places around the world. He started off in the favelas of Brazil. Uh, and lesser known, lesser seen people, and he put those posters up all over the place. He came to Times Square as part of our public art program. And it's a metaphor for what we really wanted to try and do, which was to bring lesser known voices, lesser, lesser seen people from all over the five boroughs, have them have their pictures taken, and then in the, in the midst of this digital environment, to have these analog printed pictures, which are part of Times Square's history because people used to take pictures of themselves and print them out in arcades, and to put them down in this central square. So this is one of the examples in which we engaged an artist to help people to help people be seen, to create a sense of virtual and analog community, and to help people see Times Square and invite the artist back into Times Square. So Jane Jacobs talked about how neighborhood parks usually are seen, and park-like open spaces, are considered boons or good things conferred on the deprived populations of cities. Let us turn this thought around and consider that city parks and any kind of public space are places that need the boon of life and appreciation conferred on them. In other words, a public space is not automatically a good. It's a reflection of what is going on around it and life needs to be put into it. That was very relevant for me when I spent seven years managing a project to help neighborhood parks through public-private partnerships. We got a lot of attention for a project we did on the Bronx River, which was an, uh, an underperforming and really unknown asset, public space asset within the Bronx. And we saw transformations like this kind of decrepit cement plant becoming a great park, from a dumping ground for cars becoming a place of recreation. And what I learned there was the power of programming and creativity. This is a public art project where a golden ball was floated down the river. And that was a creative person's way of drawing attention to a public space asset that people didn't know about, helping them to see it in a different way, and in the process also creating a connection and community among the people around that asset as they participated in that art project. So Times Square, named after the New York Times, which was headquartered in this building, has been around for 100 years. And while it's, been, it's known for being a gathering place for things like New Year's Eve, it's still, as a public space, been dominated by cars and by the intersection of these two major avenues for a long time. By the 1970s and 1980s, it was one of the most dangerous places in America, and 42nd Street, shown here, also was a concentrated concentration of pornography and sex-related businesses. And the public sector was so desperate to change it, and this is an important lesson for public spaces and cities, was so desperate to change it that they almost destroyed Times Square in the process of fixing it. This plan was totally approved, and were it not for a soft economy, but also, just as importantly, civic groups that rose up and said, if you create this kind of corporate environment in Times Square, you're going to destroy its essence. And so those civic groups literally got a law passed saying that you had to have commercial signage. And a different group of civic people fought to preserve the historic Broadway theaters, which were also being destroyed by development. So there's a lesson there. And as we try and change cities, we sometimes destroy the essence of parts of them. When the Alliance was created in 1992, those big plans were stalled. And so the property owners focused on the, the basics of public space management, which at that point was making it clean and safe and friendly. It wasn't until 10 and now 20 years later that we were able to focus on higher level public space problems like creativity and authenticity. Just a little bit about our district, it's about a, a half a square kilometer. The yellow area is what's known as the, is the heart of Times Square, the intersection of the major avenues. But our boundaries are actually drawn around the 40 Broadway theaters in the theater district. Our organization has an almost $20 million budget. Virtually all of it is funded by property owners or private sector. We are independent of the government. Um, and we have a large and representative board. We are one of 72 business improvement districts, organizations like this now in New York City. Most of them now are focused on smaller retail strips. 
bids grew out of a frustration with government, as did these public-private partnerships for parks, because government wasn't managing its public spaces. And in fact, when they started out, this is the way that government dealt with both the private sector and these independent organizations trying to help them. It was a one-way street, and they almost didn't even acknowledge that the private sector or these governmental civic groups existed. Slowly over time, they realized that there, was, there were two players potentially at the table, and then while it goes through different cycles, sorry, I'm missing a picture here. Uh, sorry, and, and sometimes, and, and then uh, they, they did start to interact with the private sector, but uh, they were often very rigid, as in the case here. Then they became a little bit more flexibility in terms of the ways in which they involved and interacted with this. Sometimes they could actually work side by side with other governmental entities and with multiple stakeholders. And when the system is really working, this is what you have. And yes, it is a mess. A huge part of my job and a huge part of these civic groups that take care of public spaces is coordinating and creating communication among the private sector, the property owners, the not-for-profit civic groups, and government, and the multiple agencies of government. And it's messy, but it's an essential part of what we do as these connectors. So when our organization started in 1992, we began by trying to change perceptions by partnering with entities on things like New Year's Eve, which is the, an event that we run, to change perceptions. But fundamentally, we were focusing on sanitation and clean streets. We were working on issues like homelessness, people sleeping in the streets by partnering with experienced NGOs. We partnered with Broadway to take the theatrical talent out onto the street as a way of showing that the public spaces could be viable. And we also played the very important role of having people on the street. They weren't police with the power to arrest, but they, they were the eyes and ears on the street paying attention to smaller quality of life crimes. Only 10 years later when I began in, in the job in 2002, could we start focusing on these higher level public space issues. And we've, we focused on improving the public spaces. I'll talk about this, changing Duffy Square, about bringing art and creativity to these spaces by having distinctive programming. This was a, a yoga event. The first year had three people. This year we had 14,000 people pre-registered. Because anybody can find, we said, anybody can find peace of mind in a, in a mountain or Hakone, for example. But try finding peace of mind in the middle of Times Square. And we also decided to focus on telling our story and remembering the history of Times Square, which we've been partially successful with. The result of all these things is that Times Square has re-established itself as a driver of New York City's economy, directly or indirectly producing one in 10 jobs in the city. But when I came in, the focus was no longer that you couldn't get through Times Square without getting mugged or killed. The focus was that you couldn't get through Times Square because so many people were there. So we gathered information about how many more people were coming in and how many more were coming in the future. We talked about how ugly the public spaces were. And we, we drew together people from advertising to say, what are the brand characteristics of this place? And that's relevant for any city or any public space. What are the essential characteristics? And in this case, they talked about how the brand essence of, of Times Square among many was it's that at its best, it was, it was the ultimate urban place and it was synonymous with New York. We also brought together people who had written books about Times Square and historians and said, what were the trends over time that characterized this place? They talked about the media and making news, about crowds gathering at key times, always, always about sex and desire and breaking rules, entertaining America, especially in terms of Broadway, and signage, especially commercial signage. We decided to focus on hidden architectural assets as a way of telling our story and celebrating what we had. And then we brought together artists and planners and said, how do we make sure we don't screw this up? And they said, don't make it all the same. Let there be a certain amount of chaos no matter what. Pay attention to the small human scale as well as the scale of the buildings. And remember that some people want to get through Times Square, but other people want to watch that urban experience and observe. So we talked about the importance of the, the walking uh, pedestrian environment. We laid out a set of principles, the most important of which was uh, make it a place that New Yorkers want to come to and do that by nurturing what is authentic and historic. We also talked about things like think of it as a giant theater set where certain elements are fixed and then all of the other elements are constantly changing. 
And then we set about trying to actually create a new paradigm and show what we meant with all these ideas about creating a new public space. Duffy Square, this gray area and the steps, used to look like this. It was the only public space in Times Square besides the sidewalks, and it was dysfunctional and ugly. It's where you get the discount tickets. A design that had not been realized, we brought back to life, and it, and it set a higher standard for the, for, the, for the public spaces in Times Square, although it was something that people were worried about, that only bad things would happen there if that got built. Part of the reason it worked is because the design was responsive to the core characteristics of the place. The steps mimicked a Greek amphitheater and thus referenced a core characteristic of Times Square, its theaters. And they also glow at night, so it also referenced another characteristic of Times Square, which was the digital signs. We brought in people like Jan Gell from Copenhagen, people like Pat Brown, who had been involved in, in Trafalgar Square and improving the public realm. Uh, to help us think about a different way of talking and thinking about public spaces. We had artists and architects do charrettes to help people imagine visually how this public space might be seen in a coherent way and in a different way. And we focused relentlessly on the small amount of space devoted to pedestrians, 37% when we started off. And we began incrementally changing traffic patterns to try and get 50% space, a little bit more here and there, not thinking anything else was possible. But then when uh, Mayor Bloomberg and his new transportation commissioner came in and said, we're gonna close Broadway, one of the two avenues that creates Times Square, and we're gonna go up to 73% uh, pedestrian space. We took a deep breath and we said, we have to do this, we have to try it. And this is what it looked like at first. It was not pretty. And these, these literally, the city had ordered nicer looking tables and chairs, they didn't come. So we literally went out and bought these cheap beach chairs. And we put them down, down in the street, and it was like people had spent the generations hanging out in beach chairs in the middle of the street in Times Square. And then there was a debate about the chairs themselves. And before it had all been about taxis and traffic and what was gonna happen, then people began to debate. Some people hated these new plazas, uh, the New York Post. Other people loved these plazas. And then the chairs became this obsession. People made t-shirts saying that they loved the chairs. And it was really a debate about what kind of public space and ultimately what kind of place they wanted Times Square to be. And what started to shift is that entities like New York Magazine, which had always been cynical about Times Square, said, is it possible that this might actually be a place where New Yorkers would want to hang out and spend time? So now the plazas are being built into a nicer space. They're about three quarters done. And suddenly, we had an overwhelming amount of, uh, of, of commercial, aggressive commercial activity. Many people trying to come at you and shake you down and hustle you. The worst of which were these people dressed up as Mickey Mouse or Cookie Monster who would be very aggressive with people in these public spaces. Every couple of uh, months, there'd be an issue about Cookie Monster shoving a child, or Woody, uh, one of the Toy Story char characters, arrested on sex charges. And the public space, once again, was in, this, in these ways, was going out of control. But no one would take us seriously because it seemed like a big joke. But then, as was the case before, once it was about sex, people started paying attention. And people, five days in a row, uh, top, there were, on the front page of the newspapers, were uh, topless women were also out soliciting tips and also getting aggressive with people in ways that made them uncomfortable. So after five days the, of the tabloids, the mayor finally spoke about this issue of disorder in Times Square, which he'd been talking about for two, for two years. But unfortunately, what was said was the police commissioner said, well, the solution is I'd rip up these pedestrian plazas and get rid of them. And the mayor said, well, maybe we should think about that. And we said, that's crazy. You can't control or manage a public space so the solution is get rid of it. That's not a solution, it's a surrender. And Michael Kimmelman wrote a, a, a column uh, saying, pointing out the, the absurdity of this and the lack of a, a public space vision and it galvanized public space advocates and transportation advocates who said, wait a minute, wait a minute, there may be problems with the plazas, but let's celebrate and make use of this public space. The plazas are now going to be preserved and the problems are going to be solved. We proposed a plan to regulate some of these uh, aggressive commercial behaviors, but not to ban them. So, uh, 
you may recognize this is a little bit like uh, this posture of that famous uh, sailor nurse kiss. What was interesting about this whole conversation is that it, Michael's piece and then also this New York piece have triggered a larger conversation about the nature of this public space. And it says the city's id, and that's from Freud's idea about, about this, uh, the essential subconscious that is in our minds. And this way in which Times Square has always represented the essence of New York City. And I think this is true with any public space in, 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 that it's a place where the essence of a neighborhood is reflected, uh, either in a good way or in a bad way, uh, throughout a city. And, and so the question became, how do, you, how do you realize the potential of this space? And throughout it all runs the theme of creativity. And sometimes it's, it's not just having creative events like this where we recreate the opportunity to, to, to kiss uh, as a way of celebrating Times Square's history. It's not just about having New York City focused programming for the people who work in the neighborhood. But it's taking the model of our public art program, which is still relatively new, and trying to engage all the aspects of the creative community. Our public art program began when we went to a bunch of emerging architects and said, come up with the idea, some representation of the heart for a, a, what is essentially a Valentine's Day promotion uh, uh, for romance. And, and what we saw is the interest of the creative community in coming back and doing something in Times Square. And we always thought those were the most cynical people. So then, about Times Square. So then we started doing more and more projects. Some of them are sculptural objects like this. And the ones that work are the ones that reference and relate to the essential characteristics of Times Square. So Times Square represents capitalism. So you take this sign. And then in this very democratic way, because it's a de democratic space, you ask people to vote on what they think about capitalism in the middle of this essential capitalist place. Or you take high culture and the cultural assets of the city, like the Metropolitan Opera, and you make them accessible in a new way with this opening night live broadcast on our, the digital screens in Times Square. Or this program, which is called the Midnight Moment, where on about a quarter of the digital screens in Times Square, one of our unique assets, every single night for three minutes, we have video art, and that art changes every month. <clears throat> it's bringing the, the creative community and the artists back into Times Square who are driven away. So now the question is, what's the creative and cultural vision for Times Square, and by extension, for the public realm in New York City? That's the question, and this is, this is a series of questions that you can ask for any space between buildings, any public space. What is your nightmare for that space? But also, what is your fantasy? What is your dream? And also, what do you want to keep so that if a decade, and now, a decade from now, what will still be there so you make sure you don't lose things in the process of changing them? When we asked those questions and we started to distill them, we thought, for us, part of the answer or vision is a town square that's thriving, that looks good and is well managed, that, that balances, as great cities do, both commerce and culture, the past and the future, and reflects the best of the community where that public space lies, which for us is New York City, but also we're reflective of the world. What does that mean in principles? It means um, always be changing, but don't forget what connects you to the past. Be commercial but don't let the commercial overwhelm the civic activity. Curate original programming, but also allow for the unexpected and the spontaneous. Let it be transparent and open, but not so open and so free that it's totally out of control and a free-for-all. And welcome the visitor, but most important, make sure the local, the New Yorker, feel it's theirs. What does that look like? It's taking that public art model and applying it to all things creative, whether it's the furniture, the temporary movable furniture in the street, the retail offerings on the plazas, partnering with the different creative and cultural communities in all parts of the city, because Times Square is a kind of town square that can be a place where the talent of the city, the lesser known parts of the city are amplified. And always asking how do you balance the commercial, the civic, and the cultural while you connect with the past. It might look like this, where this is a, a New York-based uh, dance troupe that did an open rehearsal a few days ago in Times Square. It might look like this, where you take 
where we took an old newsstand and brought it back in the midst of this digital environment, a newsstand populated with printed materials from artists to celebrate the printed word amidst our digital surroundings. What runs through all of these ideas, and this is available online, a set of 20 principles, so I'll be quick with it, is when you're creating a great public space, it's need to be well designed, it needs to be managed, slightly controlled so it's managed, but programmed creatively, consistently, and authentically. You need to recognize that things like cities, but a public space is always changing, and you can take a chance, but also that there's no answer. The great, it's been spoken about a lot here, that a solution that works in one place or in one city cannot be blindly applied to another place. Think about the relative assets and strengths of the public sector, the, the non-governmental organizations, and the private sector, and work on connecting them together. And this is a very New York thing. A key part of this is know thyself and love thyself. So like a New Yorker, go to your psychiatrist, understand what you don't like about yourself, but also come to understand what you do like about yourself. And like a Californian, just start to love yourself. This is a part of what every public space, every neighborhood, and every city has to do. Know what is distinctive, know what you love, and then nurture that. And don't have it be driven only by intuition, but also by facts. And then if you are trying to create change, if you're going to have a critical mass, it needs to start with the community and sometimes that community is channeled through an organization like ours, sometimes others. It needs to be consistent over time. It needs to be coherent and part of a plan. And this is a, a model for changing public spaces or other areas. And it needs to be concentrated, not dispersed. And throughout it all, it needs to be creative. If you do those things, you end up something, with something that may be pretty, it may not be pretty, but it's always a little bit crazy, which is what our cities are. Thank you.